The following content was approved in writing by the Hal Lindsey Report. The content and works provided on these playlists are governed by the copyright, duplication, processing, distribution, or any form of commercialization of such material beyond the scope of the copyright law shall require the prior written consent of its respective author or creator, or creator. Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening and welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. The book of Daniel is the most important prophetic book in the Bible, even more than the book of Revelation. But today, I'd like to focus not on the prophecies of Daniel, but on the man and his character. It is an especially timely study in a world charging headlong into a new dark age. Daniel lived one of the most remarkable lives in the history of the world. Even as a teenager, he changed the course of history. But in the story I want to examine today, many years have gone by. The Medes and Persians had defeated the Babylonians and taken their empire. Darius now ruled. For about 20 years following the death of King Nebuchadnezzar, it had seemed like Daniel's career was over. But as happened to him so often, he quickly rose through the ranks again. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom that they should be in charge of the whole kingdom. So the vast empire was run by 120 vice regents. The satraps were accountable to commissioners, and over them, three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. Now in his 80s, Daniel once again rose to become one of the most powerful men in the world. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. When this man, this Jew, grew in power and influence, it created jealousy among other high-ranking members of government. As the world grows darker, God can and will prosper and care for His people, but don't expect everything to be easy. Psalm 34 verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the psalmist doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, But the Lord delivers him out of them all. He proved it with Daniel. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Daniel here embodies something that Peter told the church. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. By no means let any of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, but in that name let him glorify God. Jesus told us to expect persecution, but for his name, not for evil doing. That's the way it was with Daniel. They looked for wrongdoing, but found him above reproach. So they went after the very thing that made him so exemplary, his devotion to God. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. That sounded great to Darius. 
it was the very kind of thing that might strengthen a king's hold on his kingdom. And the best part was that all the high government officials were in agreement. Leaders are always vulnerable to those to whom they have given power. That's why in the latter days of Joseph Stalin's reign in the Soviet Union, the worst thing that could happen to a government leader was to be promoted too high. To be placed in Stalin's inner circle meant that it was just a matter of time before he saw you as a threat and executed you. One other nice thing about that word all was that it seemed to include his most trusted servant, the wisest among them, Daniel. Maybe it was the flattery that got to the king, King Darius, but for whatever reason, he didn't realize that these men were lying to him. Daniel had not agreed. I doubt he was even consulted. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. The king of the Medes and Persians was an incredibly powerful ruler, so powerful that even he could not overrule his decrees. The phrase, the law of the Medes and the Persians, meant unalterable. The king signed the law, and the trap was set. We'll find out what happened after this message. Hal Lindsey is pleased to present his first ever audiobook, Faith for Earth's Final Hour, read in its entirety by Joel Weldon, professional voiceover artist. Recognizing the truth of Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. This audiobook is now available for purchase in three formats a nine CD set for $44.99 plus shipping and handling, a USB flash drive for $44.99 plus shipping and handling, or as an audio download from HalLindsay.com for $24.99. You can order your audiobook of Faith for Earth's Final Hour by visiting HalLindsay.com or phoning toll free 1-888-RAPTURE. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Daniel knew the document had been signed. He knew it was irrevocable. He knew the penalty. And he went to his house, kneeled toward Jerusalem, and prayed as he always had. His prayer life was systematic and regular. Here again, Daniel is a good example for us. He prayed three times a day, and a great deal of his prayer was thanksgiving. It wouldn't be a bad practice for any of us. It beats the usual, oh Lord, bail me out of this one. Daniel knowingly broke the law. The Bible teaches us to respect and usually to adhere to the laws of man. Jesus paid his taxes even to an extremely corrupt government. Paul taught that God uses human law enforcement for our protection. Romans 13.4 in the Living Bible says, The policeman is sent by God to help you. But if you're doing something wrong, of course you should be afraid. But what if there is a direct contradiction between man's law and God's? Which one do you follow? Acts chapter 5 tells us about Peter and others being brought before the high priest and his council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than man. We should determine to be like Peter and Daniel. It isn't about us, so we don't need to be making a big show to bring attention to ourselves. But we must pray especially when the law says we may not. And we will preach even when the whole world demands our silence. Daniel didn't do anything violent. He didn't become a terrorist. But he did practice civil disobedience. 
Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Notice how their plan depended on Daniel's faithfulness. It says a great deal about Daniel's character that they knew he would continue to pray. They knew he wouldn't hide his prayer by closing up his house. They knew he would do as he had always done. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king answered and said, The statement is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. In a moment of self-absorbed stupidity, King Darius' ego had been fooled by flattery. But the moment he heard the accusation against Daniel, he realized how foolish he had been. He worked the rest of the day trying to find a way out of the mess he had gotten himself and his friend Daniel into. But the power of his own word trapped him. It reminds me of the dilemma God faced when Adam and Eve chose death over life with him. He loved them, but he had given his word that sin always carries a death sentence, and his word is infinitely more certain than the law of the Medes and the Persians. Isaiah said, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away, which is, by the way, a powerful claim to his deity. If God had said, let bygones be bygones, he would be breaking his own character. God had to find a way to justly pay for our sins so that he could freely forgive those sins apart from our merit. And that's what the cross was all about. Once a man sinned, an impossible barrier was raised between him and God. Nothing man could do would produce a righteousness acceptable to God's absolute righteousness. So in God's infinite wisdom, he devised a way for his love to deliver sinners from his wrath while not compromising his righteousness and justice. Jesus Christ took upon himself a true human nature, lived as a true man, never once sinned, and therefore he qualified to take the penalty for our sins. He died in our place and secured a true forgiveness for each one who will receive it as a gift. Salvation cannot be given if any human merit is attached to it. Salvation is an absolute gift. Paul says, not through works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. We can only approach God by means of His grace. Now, when something is given by grace, it cannot be given on the basis of any merit in the recipient. God further defines grace in relation to salvation. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it is no longer of grace. Otherwise, works is no longer works. God shows here that grace and works have mutually exclusive meanings. This is so important for each one of us to understand when we receive the good news of salvation through Christ. God puts it all together through Paul. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. Grace means something given that cannot be deserved. If you think you deserve it in any way, it can't be given by grace. The main purpose of God giving His law through Moses was to show mankind 
how impossible it is to be saved by keeping the law. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus showed what keeping the law meant before God. He showed that keeping it meant not only obeying it outwardly, but in the motives of your heart. For instance, he showed that keeping the law regarding adultery meant not only doing it physically, but also not doing it in the desires of your heart. Then the Apostle James brings out the total hopelessness of seeking salvation by works. For whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles in one point, he is guilty of all. We receive the gift of salvation by means of grace, which allows for no human merit. And we receive salvation through the agency of faith, which is the one thing we can do that has no merit in it. Faith simply receives the work of Christ who totally purchased our salvation through his death in our place. And even the faith is declared to be a gift of God along with salvation. Read it carefully. So we cannot even boast that we somehow cranked up faith. There are going to be all kinds of people in heaven, but there will not be any boasters. I'll have more on this after this break. Thank you so much for standing with me as a watchman on the wall. I pray daily that he will reward your faithfulness and protect and prosper you in these difficult times. Thank you again for being a vital part of my team. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit HalLindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE. Now it's fascinating that King Darius faced a dim reflection of God's great dilemma. Darius wanted to save Daniel, but he could not break the law of the Medes and Persians. Today, we see politicians changing laws to suit their political purposes, but in those days, Everyone was a fundamentalist. Ting Darius spent the rest of the day right up to the deadline, which was sunset, trying to find a way to rescue Daniel. Then the politicians came back eager for their 150 pounds or so of flesh. They said, recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. With great reluctance, the king did as the law demanded. He gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. Now things started to get really interesting. Darius had been thinking about this all day long. He probably consulted law professors and legal experts only to learn again that there was no way out. But during the day, something else occurred to the king. What about Daniel's God? He knew Daniel, the quality of his life and the quality of his mind. He knew that Daniel's faith was not just a tradition for him, but a living relationship with a being that Daniel fully trusted. So the king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Darius couldn't rescue Daniel. He spent the whole day trying, and he couldn't do it. So at last... He does the only thing left to him. He trusts Daniel's God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why did God let this happen to Daniel? Because Daniel's response created a fabulous lesson for all who would hear the story, and especially for Darius. He was the first king of the Persian Empire. He had many gods. He knew there was something unusual about the God Daniel worshipped. He had probably heard some of the amazing stories recounted earlier in the book of Daniel. And he certainly had seen the amazing life that Daniel lived before him. Even so, he had not come to the conclusion that Daniel served the one true God until sometime that night. And here he makes a remarkable profession of faith. 
Daniel, your God, will himself deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing might be changed in regard to Daniel. Now the irrevocable law of the Medes and Persians will stand as a witness to the power of God. By using his seal and that of his nobles, Darius ensured the integrity of the miracle. The law of the Medes and Persians meant that anyone who messed with the seal would pay with his life. When the body of Jesus was placed in the tomb, remember, a stone was rolled over that entrance too. In the 27th chapter of Matthew, the Pharisees went to Pilate and asked him to give orders for the grave to be made secure. So Pilate sent Roman guards and they set a seal on the stone. That stone weighed almost 4,000 pounds. The seal it bore was that of the Roman Emperor Tiberius Caesar. But in spite of all man's machinations, God raised Jesus from the dead. And when the angels rolled back the stone, it wasn't to let Jesus out. It was so everyone could see that he was already gone. In Daniel, we have a type of that, a foretaste. Here is Daniel in the place of death. Those weren't kitties he was with in there. This was a form of execution, and like all executioners, these Persians knew their job. They didn't put well-fed cats in the den with Daniel, but hungry lions, violent and ferocious. And Daniel was down there with these lions all night long. He was in the place of death, and when he was released the next day, it was much like being raised from the dead. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him. His sleep fled from him. The king was in distress all night long. It says he was fasting. To whom? To the God of Daniel. Then the king arose with the dawn at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. And when he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? At this point, Darius heard a familiar voice. O king, live forever. Can you imagine his joy and wonder at that moment? Daniel said, My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury, whatever, was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king thought that it would be Daniel's service to God that would save him. He had said, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. And when he came the next morning, he asked, Has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you? But when he wrote down his story, Daniel made it clear that this was not a deliverance based on his works, but his faith. It was because he trusted in his God. That trust did not mean he knew for sure the lions would not consume him. Many decades before, his friends famously known by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were about to be thrown into King Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. They expressed the faith Daniel must have had going into the lion's den. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. To those who espouse 
positive confession, it might not sound right for Shadrach and company to say, but even if he does not deliver us. In reality, that was one of the greatest confessions you will ever hear. Faith says, God is able to deliver me from my present circumstances, but deliver me or not, I still will serve him to my last breath. Daniel knew that these lions were hungry. He knew the laws of nature and that unless God miraculously intervened, he would be eaten alive, and that is a terrible prospect. He knew for sure that God was able to deliver him, but like Christians in Roman arenas, he also knew that God might make the choice to bring him home that night. I don't believe Daniel was afraid to die, but he was a human being, and he certainly dreaded the thought of roaring lions ripping him to pieces. Satan surely showed up about this time, I'm sure, trying to give him a mental image of what dismemberment would feel and sound like. Daniel had to have combat faith, trusting the promises of God, not just for a moment, but all night long. What did he do? He trusted and kept on trusting. Through Daniel's witness, King Nebuchadnezzar eventually found the one true God, and he sent out a decree containing his testimony to all the world. The same thing happened with Darius. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. And he went on from there to extol the virtues of the one true God. And by the way, King Darius rounded up the ones who plotted against Daniel and threw them and their families into the den. And the lions finally had their feast. You can't lose if you claim the promises of God and keep trusting them. That's it for tonight. God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsay.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.